the king's jewel, the blue diamond, the French blue, the Tavernier blue, the hope diamond. Call it what you will, this billion-year-old hunk of boron, hydrogen, and nitrogen is one of the world's largest and most famous gemstones. It weighs 45 carats, and over centuries, it has graced royal crowns and aristocratic bosoms alike. It's also seriously fucking cursed. Rulers beheaded, monarchies overthrown, houses burnt down, fortunes lost, dogs strangled. Just about every bad thing that can happen to a person, or their pet, has been attributed to this notorious piece of jewelry. Join me as we open a priceless chapter of The Datacombs in this installment of Cursed, The Hope Diamond. The stone that has become known as the Hope Diamond originated in India, home of the world's most lucrative diamond mines, sometime in the 17th century. In its original form, it weighed an incredible 112 carats and was nearly the size of a man's fist. Natural blue diamonds are incredibly rare, and most are much smaller than this one. Even after being cut down to less than half of its original size, the Hope Diamond remains the largest blue diamond in the world. The diamond striking color is the result of tiny impurities in the form of boron atoms, impurities that also result in a more sinister quality. After being exposed to light, the diamond becomes phosphorescent, glowing a brilliant blood red color after all visible light sources have been extinguished. The earliest accounts describe a beautiful violet stone of the highest clarity, though the color is more accurately described as a deep, steely blue. The gem first appears in historical records in the year 1666, when it was in the possession of a French gem merchant and adventurer by the name of Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. He claims that it came from the Collar Mine in the Gunter district of Andhra Pradesh, then known as the Kingdom of Golonkanda, but no records exist to verify its origins, nor how the diamond, now known as the Tavernier Blue, came into the Frenchman's hands. There are several versions of the story, but most agree that the diamond was originally placed in the eye of a statue of the Hindu goddess Sita before being stolen, either by a corrupt Indian priest, Tavernier himself, or another greedy foreigner. According to legend, the pious priest who discovered it missing placed a curse on the thief and whoever possessed the diamond. Other, less sensational accounts suggest that Tavernier purchased the gem from the king of Golconda. Whether he acquired it legally or not, Tavernier soon brought back the massive, uncut stone to France. Upon his return, Tavernier visited the newly built palace of Versailles, where he presented the diamond to King Louis XIV. In 1668, the Sun King purchased the Tavernier Blue, along with around 200 other diamonds. Shortly afterwards, the adventurer is said to have fallen ill while traveling, dying of a raging fever before his body was torn to shreds, either by a pack of wolves or rabid wild dogs, Accounts differ as to the species of the canine culprit, but all are in agreement that the diamond's curse had claimed its first victim. In 1673, Louis XIV had the rough, irregularly shaped gem recut into something more befitting the Sun King. Two years of work resulted in the 67 carat jewel, known as the French Blue, or the Blue Diamond of France. He usually wore it on a golden cravat pin or on a ribbon hanging from his neck, but occasionally he let a lucky courtier borrow it. The first to borrow the French blue was the King's Minister of Finance, Nicolas Fouquet. After wearing the stone, he became embroiled in scandal, was accused of embezzlement, and banished from France. In an act of mercy, Louis instead sentenced him to imprisonment, and Fouquet languished in the fortress of Pignon for 16 years. Records indicate that he died there in 1680, but others believed he lived on, becoming the man in the Iron Mask. Louis next loaned the gem to his favorite mistress, Madame de Montespan, a powerfully influential courtier who some called 
the true Queen of France. After wearing the diamond, she too fell from grace and was implicated in a series of poisonings and acts of black magic designed to secure her position as official mistress, lest the king tire of her and replace her with a younger woman. She too was banished from court, but survived the more dire fate of her co-conspirators, who were unceremoniously beheaded. King Louis himself seems to have escaped the curse relatively unscathed, although he did undergo a dangerous, painful surgery to correct an abscess of the royal anus. It must have been a pain in the ass, but the Sun King survived the operation and went on to live for many years. The same cannot be said for his children. All but one of his legitimate heirs died before the age of five, and his sole surviving heir was dead by 1711. The elderly king died a painful death of gangrene in 1715 and was succeeded by his five-year-old great-grandson, Louis XV. The French Blue's new owner was similarly lucky and survived multiple assassination attempts during his reign. However, his loved ones were not. When the king's favorite mistress, Madame de Pompadour, died in the winter of 1764, her royal lover was too heartbroken to attend her funeral. His son and heir died of tuberculosis in 1765, and his grief-stricken queen soon followed him to the grave. Louis XV survived his annus horribilis for another decade until smallpox claimed his life. Once again, the throne passed to the late king's grandson, and along with it, the blue diamond. Louis XVI and his much maligned wife, Marie Antoinette, wouldn't inherit their ancestors' luck, however. After 15 years of wildly unpopular, scandal-laden rule, a violent revolution overthrew the French monarchy. In 1791, the royal couple made a desperate attempt to escape France, but made the mistake of taking the crown jewels with them. Less than a day after fleeing from Paris, they were caught, imprisoned, and separated from the doomed jewel for the final time. As we all know, the king and queen would later meet their end at the hands of the guillotine. What is less well known is that before their royal heads rolled, another French aristocrat met a much more gruesome fate. The Princess de Lamballe had been a close personal confidant of Marie Antoinette, and the queen had lent her the French blue on several occasions. When the princess was imprisoned and condemned to death after refusing to denounce her royal friends, she was handed over to a mob of bloodthirsty revolutionaries who literally tore her limb from limb, taking intimate pieces of her body as prizes before disemboweling and decapitating her. The unfortunate princess's head was placed on a pike and paraded in front of the window of Marie Antoinette's prison. After the fall of the French monarchy, the French blue disappeared. It was stolen from the royal treasuries, along with the rest of the crown jewels, during five nights of looting in 1792. Some say the jewel was destroyed out of contempt for the aristocracy, while others suggest that it was used as a bribe to ward off foreign armies from invading the young republic. Napoleon Bonaparte swore to recover the French crown jewels, and although some were eventually found, the French blue never resurfaced. At least, not in its previous form. The most plausible theory is that the diamond was smuggled out of the country and altered to disguise its true identity. After all, the theft would yield no profit if it was identified and returned to the French government. Records suggest that it was taken to London, where it was recut by a Dutch jeweler named William Falls, who reduced the stolen jewel down to the 45 carat diamond we know today. Legend has it that after Falls had completed the job, he was murdered by his son Heinrich, who stole the gem before committing suicide. In 1812, a massive blue diamond weighing over 45 carats appeared in London. Rumors that the rare gem had been cut from the French blue abounded, a theory backed up by the fact that it was put up for sale exactly 20 years after the theft, two days after the state of limitations placed on revolutionary crimes had expired. The owner, a Mr. Daniel Ellison, allegedly committed suicide shortly afterwards. Records are inconsistent as to who obtained the diamond next. Some say it was sold to King George IV as a trophy to commemorate the defeat of Napoleon. Indeed, the king can be seen wearing a large blue diamond in a portrait painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds in 1822. If he was the cursed gem's next owner, he met an appropriate fate. The obese, drug-addicted king died bankrupt in 1830, and the Duke of Wellington is said to have sold the diamond in order to pay off his enormous debts. The next confirmed owner of the diamond was Henry Philip Hope, a member of a lavishly wealthy family of London bankers who would help finance the Louisiana Purchase. His vast gem catalog included a massive blue jewel surrounded by smaller diamonds, referred to simply as number one. The catalog provides no provenance, and its origin remains a mystery. His wife often wore the jewel to society balls, and it soon became known as the Hope Diamond. The well-to-do Hope family met with misfortune, and after the death of the couple's only son, Henry Philip Hope died without an heir. After a lengthy legal battle over the estate, the diamond passed to his nephew, Lord Henry Thomas Hope. 
The succeeding generations of Hope squandered the family's fortune, and in 1887, it passed to Lord Francis Hope and his wife, an American showgirl named May Yohi. The diamond soon cursed Francis in both luck and love. His wife ran off with a handsome army officer, and a series of poor business investments and even worse bets at the horse track ruined him financially. In 1902, he sold the Hope Diamond to a New York jeweler named Simon Frankel for $148,000, but his bad luck didn't end there. The next year, he lost his foot in a hunting accident. As for Mei Yohi, she didn't fare much better. Her lover deserted her, her stage career ended, and the society woman who had once proudly worn the Hope Diamond died in poverty and obscurity. She blamed her fate on the diamond, publicly proclaiming that it would curse all who owned it. The Frankos attempt to sell their cursed commodity without success. The Hope Diamond remained locked away in a safe for six years, until the jeweler went bankrupt. Sometime before World War I, it was sold to a French financier named Jacques Colloyer. Not long after the purchase, the once successful businessman went insane and committed suicide. The diamond next fell into the hands of a Russian prince by the name of Ivan Kenatovsky. He had fallen madly in love with a French dancer of the Foie Bourgat, a certain Mademoiselle Ladoux. The prince loaned the Hope Diamond to his sweetheart before he too suffered a mental breakdown and shot her from his theater box. The mad prince soon met a similar fate, stabbed to death in the streets of Paris by a group of Russian revolutionaries. In 1908, the jewel briefly returned to the Frankels before it was sold to a Greek merchant named Simon Mantherides. His car soon careened off a cliff, killing himself along with his wife and child. Whether this was an accident, an intentional murder, or a spontaneous act of madness is up for debate. Later that year, the diamond was purchased by the Sultan of Turkey, Abdul Hamid II, for the rumored sum of $400,000. He presented it as a gift to his favorite concubine. Unfortunately, she didn't get to enjoy it for long, as she was stabbed to death during a botched robbery attempt soon after receiving the accursed present. The thief was apprehended, tortured, and hung, along with the man who had polished the stone. A few months after acquiring the diamond, the Sultan, a reviled ruler who had come to be known as Abdul the Damned, was overthrown by a popular revolt, but not before having it smuggled to Paris to avoid seizure by the revolutionaries. The man who had been tasked with guarding the diamond was hung by a mob, and at a fitting end to this particularly bloody chapter of this cursed jewel's history, the Persian diamond merchant who had brokered the sale drowned in a shipwreck. In 1909, the diamond was once again offered up for sale in Paris. It was purchased by Cartier for the paltry sum of 500,000 francs, equivalent to nearly two and a half million US dollars today. The Prince of Jewelers reset the stone in an oval platinum setting surrounded by smaller diamonds, creating the current incarnation of the Hope Diamond. Unfortunately, Cartier had a difficult time finding a buyer, and it looked like his risky investment would become a business ruining mistake. As luck would have it, the jeweler seemed immune to the diamond's curse, and he developed a plan to make a profit by means of a wealthy American heiress with a fondness for ridiculously expensive jewelry. Her name was Evelyn Walsh, and her father had literally struck gold by discovering one of the largest gold mines in America. At the age of 19, she married Edward McLean, son of an even wealthier family and the heir to the Washington Post newspaper fortune. Money does not always go hand in hand with common sense, however, and this power couple of the Gilded Age had far more of the former than the latter. Their shared hobby was conspicuous consumption on a scale that is almost unimaginable today. Edward was an avid thoroughbred horse owner, while his wife's particular vice was rare jewels. I cannot help if I have a passion for them, Evelyn admitted. They make me feel comfortable and even happy. The truth is, when I neglect to wear jewels, astute members of my family call in doctors because it's a sign that I'm becoming ill. Cartier had met the gem-obsessed heiress a few years earlier when she purchased the Star of the East, a 94.8 carat white diamond from the renowned jeweler for $120,000. He had tried to sell her the Hope Diamond once before, but Evelyn wasn't interested. After having reset it, he once again approached the heiress, suggesting that she take it home for a few days before making a final decision. Cartier gambled that once the stunning gem was in her possession, it would be impossible for her to give it back. He was right. According to Evelyn, for hours the jewel stared at me, and at some time during the night I began to think I really wanted the thing. Then I put the chain around my neck and hooked my life to its destiny, for good or evil. The next day, her husband bought the Hope Diamond for $180,000, equivalent to about $5 million today. News of the sale made international headlines, along with mentions of the curse. May Yohi, the disgraced showgirl who believed the diamond was cursed, wrote to the papers to publicly warn Evelyn against the purchase. Cartier, too, may have believed in the curse. 
The sale contract included a clause stating, should any fatality occur to the family of Edward B. McLean within six months, the said Hope Diamond is agreed to be exchanged for jewelry of equal value. Evelyn wasn't convinced, but nevertheless, she had the diamond blessed by a Catholic priest. Supposedly, a lightning storm erupted during the ceremony and the church was rocked by thunder. Evelyn wasn't deterred, later commenting, ever since that day, I've worn my diamond as a charm. For a few years, she peacefully enjoyed her charm, posing for portraits while wearing it and flaunting it around high society. She hid the diamond in bushes during lavish garden parties and invited her guests to play her favorite game, Find the Hope. Even her Great Dane had the honor of wearing the diamond on its collar. It may have seemed like nothing more than innocent fun and games, but like so many owners before, the curse's misfortune would soon befall the family. In 1912, Evelyn's mother-in-law died of pneumonia, along with two of the family's servants. Her son Vincent was struck by a car outside their country estate, known as Friendship, and in 1919, he died of his injuries. The couple separated in 1929 after her husband left Evelyn for another woman, and by 1932, the Washington Post went bankrupt. That same year, Evelyn attempted to pawn off the Hope Diamond in order to hire an investigator and provide ransom money when Charles Lindbergh's baby was kidnapped. Her offer was refused and the diamond was returned, but sadly, Lindbergh's infant son was soon found dead. Pro tip, don't get a cursed object involved in the case of an abducted child. It might end badly. In 1941, Edward McLean died of brain atrophy due to alcohol saturation. Five years later, the couple's only daughter died of an overdose at the age of 25. She had worn the Hope Diamond on her wedding day. Despite this series of unfortunate events, Evelyn never admitted the diamond was cursed. She continued to wear it until her death in 1947. In 1949, Harry Winson, a New York jeweler known as the King of Diamonds, who owned one third of the world's most famous jewels, purchased Evelyn's entire estate. Whether out of fear of his newest acquisition or love of the American people, he promptly sent his entire collection on a nine-year tour of the United States before donating the lot to the Smithsonian Institute. As fate would have it, this grand gesture of selflessness would claim one final victim, as if the diamond itself demanded one final sacrifice. In 1958, Winston mailed the Hope Diamond to the Smithsonian in a plain brown paper box for the price of $2.44 in postage and $155 in insurance. The mailman who delivered the parcel to its final destination, James Todd, was soon involved in a truck accident, which crushed one of his legs. Then, another accident, in which he received a head injury. One day, the battered postman came home to find his dog strangled to death, and in the final death rattle of the diamond's curse, Todd's house mysteriously burned to the ground. The curse seemed not to affect objects such as public institutions. According to curator Jeff Post, since the arrival of the Hope Diamond, the National Gem Collection has grown steadily in size and stature, and is today considered by many to be the finest public display of gems in the world. For the Smithsonian, the Hope Diamond has obviously been a source of good luck. Winston's donation inspired others to do the same, such as the 423 carat Logan Sapphire, the 68 carat Victoria Transvaal Diamond, and the 31 carat Blue Heart Diamond along with the Napoleon necklace, commissioned by the emperor in 1811 as a gift to his second wife. Today, the Hope Diamond is safely secured within the walls of the Smithsonian, where the glittering relic slowly rotates within a glass cabinet, ensuring a safe distance is kept between the cursed stone and its curious visitors. Millions of people visit the Blood Diamond every year, drawn by its beauty as much as its infamy, and by the legend of its litany of victims. The brown paper box it was mailed in has been preserved too. You can visit it in the National Postal Museum, a tribute to history's most unfortunate mailman. If this story has inspired any of you to plot a diamond heist of your own, don't let the estimated price tag of $350 million tempt you. The Hope Diamond may be safe to view from a distance, but for legal and ethical reasons, I cannot condone any attempt to steal it, lest the thief unleash a dormant curse by freeing the gem from the glass chamber of its crystal crypt. However, if you choose to ignore my most dire warnings, please snatch the Napoleon necklace from me while you're there.